Now, without further ado, we will get things rolling on the sustainability stage. And to get started, we've got a state of sustainability address from Ecology Ottawa's Executive Director, Rob Barnes. Before joining Ecology Ottawa as a volunteer in 2013, Rob worked in the nonprofit, public, and private sectors. Rob brought advocacy and experience to Ecology Ottawa from his time in politics and nonprofits, and policy experience from his time in management consultants, working closely with various levels of government. Rob is passionate about environmental and animal welfare issues, community organizing, urban design, and a whole lot more. Rob holds a master's in public and international affairs, where he focused on the intersection of eco ecological economics and urban sprawl. So without further ado, let's bring in Rob Barnes and welcome him to the sustainability stage. Thanks so much, Nick. And uh, thanks to the, the entire team at SmartNet Alliance uh, for, for uh, preparing this. And thanks to all of you for taking time out of your uh, Saturdays to, uh, to enjoy this virtual showcase. It's such an honor to, uh, to speak here. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it'll be a great conversation. So what we're going to do is uh, basically uh, I'll, I'll chat for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions and answers uh, afterwards. Um, so as Nick said, I'm, my name is Rob Barnes. I'm the executive director of Ecology Ottawa, and Ecology Ottawa is a local environmental organization working to make Ottawa the green capital of Canada. We're an advocacy organization uh, that focuses mostly on the city. So, so today I'll be talking about the state of the city. You know, wh what are things looking like across a range of environmental issues as we head into 2021? So I'll just chat a little bit about Ecology Ottawa, you know, a little, little plug for the organization. Uh, we're, we've been around since 2006, um, organizing in communities to uh, basically uh, find the people across the city who, who share basic values. We think there's hundreds of thousands of Ottawans who care deeply about the environment and want to take action in a variety of ways. And so Ecology Ottawa exists to provide uh, the public with, with, you know, with information, uh, but also with opportunities to take action. We're a volunteer-driven organization, and I encourage uh, folks to, to check us out and get involved, um, either with Ecology Ottawa or with other groups like SmartNet Alliance or with your community association. There's so many ways to get involved in environmental issues in the city. Uh, so just, just and, and I think the strength of our city and progress on these issues is really uh, a, a function of how involved uh, the public is. So I'm going to talk about three main areas today, um, and, and, and they kind of fall into buckets. You know, we, we categorize things this way at Ecology Ottawa. Um, and so uh, I'll be talking about Renewable City, which is our program area devoted to energy and the climate transition. I'll be talking about Active City, which is really sustainable transportation in the city of Ottawa. Things like transit and cycling and, and, and pedestrian access. Uh, and finally, I'll be talking about Living City, the trees, water, and green space that really make our city such a beautiful place to call home. And we'll be talking about a range of issues across those three areas. So let's start with Renewable City. Uh, what's the progress on especially climate change uh, as, as we move into 2021? And again, the focus being at City Hall, uh, uh, how, is, how is the mayor and how are council doing on this, this large challenge, right? And you know, later today, Nick mentioned you'll be hearing from folks like Janice, Janice Ashworth, who are extremely knowledgeable about energy evolution, the city's climate program. I'll talk a little bit about the high level piece, you know, how are emissions uh, year over year and uh, what kind of funding especially are we seeing towards action on this issue? So, so again, energy evolution is big, very important. And this year actually marked uh, the second and final chapter of energy evolution, which is the city's uh, comprehensive climate strategy. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. It's that you can find it at the City of Ottawa website, but it really is a comprehensive multifaceted plan to, uh, to conduct the energy transition for, for Ottawa and to reduce our emissions uh, in line with IPCC targets. As some of you uh, may recall, in April 2019, the City of Ottawa passed a climate emergency declaration and as part of that declaration, we actually strengthened our targets. Uh, years ago, we had uh, targets basically that aligned with the kind of two degrees centigrade uh, warming. And, and now uh, the new targets align with 1.5 degrees centigrade warming. So, so lower targets, more ambitious targets, and energy evolution is basically our means of getting there. 
Um, and so really, you know, at a high level, uh, the, the plan is, is, as I said, multifaceted, uh, complex, uh, largely good. You know, we're, we're, we're very much in favor of, of proceeding on, on, on energy evolution. And then the question for us is really, you know, how much follow through are we going to see from the city? Because any jurisdiction around the world, it's one thing to come up with a plan. It's another thing to, to follow through and, and see the funding required. So let's talk a little bit about that. And let's talk about the high level picture about our emissions in the city of Ottawa. So this is a picture of Ottawa's community emissions, which, are, which is to say these are the greenhouse gas emissions that are occurring uh, in all the area uh, that, that is the city of Ottawa. So these aren't just city of Ottawa holdings like, you know, uh, city hall and various municipal buildings and, and the OC transfer uh, fleet. This is, in fact, all emissions that take place within the boundaries of our city. And as you can see here, you know, four main sources, buildings, so how we heat, cool, and electrify our homes, offices, and other buildings, transportation, how we move around the city, uh, waste, um, which is, you know, to a large extent, methane uh, coming off of, of, of landfills, and then agriculture, and, and again, uh, methane being, being a, a large piece of that. So these are the, the, the emissions by sector. Ottawa does not look very unique if you compare us to other jurisdictions in Ontario. So uh, this, is, this is good in the sense that we can learn from cities like Toronto, like Hamilton, like Windsor, as they, as they embark on, on the energy transition as well. This is what it looks like when we break it down by source. You know, uh, it's one thing to talk in these high level terms. It's another thing to think about, okay, so where are emissions actually coming from? Well, a lot of natural gas usage to heat our homes, right? And buildings and a lot of gasoline and diesel uh, to fuel our transportation fleet and, and a variety of other things like heating oil, propane, aviation, fuel, et cetera. Um, and so energy evolution is really a comprehensive plan to tackle those emissions sources. Um, how are we doing? This chart is taken from the most recent um, climate change update. And I would just draw your attention to the year line at the bottom. It doesn't, it's not, uh, you know, uh, it's not it's not broken out in, in a, maybe a, the most logical way possible. You know, you jumps from 2012 to 2016 and then goes from 2019 to 2025. Um, but that said, it does give you a picture of of our emissions trajectory to date. So far, the largest emissions reduction in Ottawa, you can see that the, the, the step down between 2012 and 2016, that came as a result of the coal phase out, which is actually provincial policy. So, so in many ways, I think Ottawa City Council owes a debt of gratitude to Dalton McGuinty and, 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 and the leadership of, of the previous Liberal government for bringing down those emissions as far as they've gone. Since that time, we've been inching back up year over year um, to a large extent. And I think that speaks to the absence of a climate plan with a, with a real strategy. So this is the first year where we're actually finally seeing the completion of energy evolution in a comprehensive plan. Will it be enough to get us down to, you know, a 43% reduction by 2025, 68% reduction by 2030, and net zero by 2050? That is the million dollar question. And, and I think uh, the, the short answer is, uh, maybe, but we need great ambition to get there. And that's a, that's a point of concern for College Ottawa and advocates from across the city. You know, is the city putting its money where its mouth is, especially when it comes to climate action? So far, I would argue the case is no. The city is not putting its money where its mouth is uh, and, and has a great deal more ambition uh, that it needs to step up in order to reach these, these targets. Um, and I'm just going to show you three, three graphics, uh, basically, from the last budget session where this, this one shows uh, how much of energy evolution is actually funded versus how much is supposed to be funded as per energy evolution. You know, Janice, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we'll, we'll go over this in greater detail later, but basically energy evolution is uh, costly upfront. It's $621 million a year investment required to uh, achieve our energy, to, to achieve our greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, but the flip side of that is that this is actually an investment. Uh, if we put up front this amount of money, we will save uh, billions of dollars over the long run. So it's, it's actually a huge investment in terms of saving money on energy, uh, more efficient homes. So, so, so there's, a, there's a financial, a fiscal logic to these, these green investments. It's really strong, um, but it requires upfront spending. And the city of Ottawa so far in the last budget is only funding a tiny fraction of what energy evolution recommends that it commit to. 
Now, they're only funding a small piece of energy evolution, but they're, they're spending a lot of money in other areas instead. And so this is, uh, you know, a quick, uh, a quick analysis of, of where they're spending in the last budget. You know, the, the, the headline is don't let Ottawa's, you know, budget be a, a sprawl budget. The city still spends overwhelmingly on road growth, resurfacing, infrastructure, asphalt, some of which, you know, uh, I think there's strong arguments for, uh, but largely road expansions and widenings are a money pit for the city that that do very little good over the long term in terms of you know reducing congestion. So something to keep in mind uh, when we we ask ourselves, you know, is there money for this? Yes, but it's uh, it's being it's busy being spent on other things. Um, and and this is just another example. This is the Strandherd wide drive uh, Strandherd drive widening is uh, 133 13 million dollar cost um, versus energy evolution. Uh, uh, for 2021, $2.6 million. So, so the, the city has not yet indicated that it is prioritizing climate action and, and we're going to be continuing to press it to, to really step up its game. So what else to watch for when it comes to climate action, and really this applies to every environmental issue, is the new official plan. Uh, the city, some of you might, might know this, the city is renewing its official plan. This is a major policy and land use document that'll guide the shape and the fabric of our city for the next generation, basically right out to 2046. So it's really incredibly important that we get it right. And so actually public comments are now open. If you visit the city's website, you can, you can feed into the official plan and they close on February 17th. Uh, council will vote on the new official plan on June, uh, in, in mid-June. Um, and really the, the new official plan has everything to do with green space, where we're building our transportation corridors, although more detail will come in the transportation master plan. Uh, this proposed gold belt that you're seeing in this map here, which is the kind of outer ring beyond the suburban areas, uh, whether there will be a new suburb, for example, the Taewin development that just was announced recently in the southeast corner of the city. So, so a real question about our future form and growth uh, and this really has impacts across all issue areas from, from green space protection to climate action to the viability of our public transit system and active transportation. Um, let's look though at, at quick, while we're on the subject of land use planning, just some, some important uh, climate related elements. And this is actually a list from Dr. Diane Sachs, the former environmental commissioner of Ontario, when she was summarizing uh, the most important measures uh, that can be taken uh, for action on climate change. She listed pricing carbon as number one, which is, you know, usually tops the list when you ask economists and other policy experts. Uh, but she also mentioned enhancing density and protecting nature is absolutely critical to progress on climate action. And when you think about what a city can do, uh, enhancing density or stopping sprawl and protecting nature are mission critical and they are completely within the powers of cities uh, to take on. That said, I, sh I should, I should uh, contextualize a little bit and say, they are very much within the powers of cities, although cities remain creatures of the province and are guided by the provincial policy statement. Happy to unpack that later. But that said, cities uh, have a lot of uh, power here. And so we're looking for the city of Ottawa to lead in terms of stopping sprawl, enhancing density and protecting nature. And, and with this in mind, I think uh, cities around the, the world are now starting to look at this concept of 15 minute neighborhoods, how we're planning our, our communities and stay tuned for that in the new official plan. The new official plan has a lot of this language. And what does it mean? It means more density, more dynamic neighborhoods and more transportation choice. And I really encourage anyone who's listening to, to engage in the new official plan and, and, and push for these elements that, that will characterize 15 minute neighborhoods. Let's talk quickly about active city. This is, you know, sustainable transportation, a biking, transit, walking, uh, pedestrian infrastructure. And here really, I'd say the biggest thing that's happened uh, recently is uh, it occurred in, in 2019, uh, which is the passage of the, the um, Ottawa Road Safety Action Plan version 3.0. And again, I think as with uh, uh, climate change, it's, it's a mixed result, right? What we're seeing is you've got some good plans and then the question is implementation. In the case of this plan in particular, um, one, of the, one of the features is again, uh, how much money are we putting into road safety to make it uh, pleasant and, and, and interesting and, and, and safe for, for folks to take alternative means of transportation beyond the, the automobile? And again, this is a look at the 2020 budget, but the, the, the result is that the city continues to prioritize elsewhere, you know, uh, spends more than twice the amount on road growth projects in 2020 versus road safety initiatives. Um, 
And then the other piece uh, is that, you know, the result is that we still have a relatively high fatality rate per 100,000 population. Um, you know, we, we do maybe a little bit better than Sweden as a whole when you compare us to the, 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 the ground zero for vision zero, which is a, a comprehensive plan for road safety. Uh, but when you compare us to Swedish cities like Stockholm uh, and other European cities, especially Ottawa is still way behind. So, so we can do a lot more to, to make our streets amenable to other forms of transportation. And this isn't about, uh, you know, taking away uh, people's access to the car. I think there's, it's really exciting to hear that there's a, an electric vehicle aspect to the showcase. It's really about increasing the transportation choice so that there are more safe options that people can take and more convenient options that people can take in all weather conditions across our city. Um, Unfortunately, the current plan from the city of Ottawa actually has a number of current and projected road deaths. It's actually estimated in their document. And so, you know, over the next four years on the right, this is how many uh, uh, individuals we expect to see die uh, because of city policy. And so uh, Vision Zero that I mentioned earlier is a, a, a way in which cities and countries around the world are kind of retooling how they think about active transportation and roads more generally. And what it means is that we're going to design roads in the future to eliminate severe death and injury. Ottawa's not there yet. Uh, we still are essentially planning for a number of, of deaths and severe injuries on our streets. We can do better. So as with climate change, there's a question of ambition and we're always encouraging the city to go faster and further in terms of protecting uh, 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 vulnerable road users, but all road users more generally. Uh, but we are still seeing progress, just not the progress we'd like to see. Let's talk really quickly about uh, Living City in the last uh, last few minutes here. Again, this is the, the area focused on trees, water, and green space, as you can tell from this, uh, this lovely image. So um, trees remain a massive concern across the city. Uh, at Ecology Ottawa, we have a tree campaign. We hear from tree advocates in every corner of the city uh, who want to protect, plant, and promote trees. And the city of Ottawa is actually making a uh, good headway there. Uh, this is an image from 2017, where uh, we actually presented uh, city staff and council with a, a little tree that we made out of the, uh, the that indicated the, the, the kind of names and postal codes of individuals who signed a petition for a strong urban forest management plan. And that plan was passed in 2017. And maybe it'll sound like a broken uh, record here, but again, it's one thing to, to, to pass a plan, it's another thing to fully implement it. So far, we've been pleased to see that the city has largely stuck to the implementation of the Urban Forest Management Plan. It's funding that plan, it's finding staff, it's taking the actions in the plan, but every once in a while there's slippage. And we saw with COVID, uh, with the onset of COVID uh, uh, at around spring and moving into summer, um, the city started backtracking on some elements of this plan and we, we needed to step up. Thanks to the thousands of supporters across the city who raised their voices, the city is now back on track. You know, attention was drawn to the fact that it was slipping on some of the objectives of the urban forest management plan and it's now back on track. So we're happy to see that, but we encourage all of us to stay vigilant, watch the city's tree file and Ecology Ottawa will do its best to report back that information. Also, you know, uh, in, in the last year, College Ottawa embarked on a plan uh, to uh, really focus on urban biodiversity. And we want Ottawa to be a biodiversity champion. Cities around the world are realizing that uh, biodiversity isn't just something out there. You know, we sometimes think of it as something that way beyond cities, uh, maybe it happens in the boreal forest, maybe it happens on vast tracts of land somewhere. But cities, you know, where human habitation tends to cluster, also tend to be biodiverse areas. And so there's this real push and pull, you know, are we building the urban fabric in such a way that it's bird safe, bird friendly, pollinator friendly? Um, and so last year we started with a, a number of bio blitzes and this year we will continue that. And we're also working on a, a campaign objective uh, this year, um, uh, essentially to, to push the city towards uh, uh, changing its bylaws to be uh, much more friendly to biodiversity, uh, whether it means, you know, more biodiverse lawns and gardens or more biodiverse parks and, uh, and, and green space. So, so stay tuned for that. So what to watch for in the, in the months ahead as we move into 2021? I think we've all got our eye on uh, the vaccine and when that's going to arrive, obviously. Um, but, you know, uh, thinking about the city policy files, as I said, the new official plan is just 
absolutely mission critical for all of us who care about the environment. It's got so many elements in it that it'll affect every single element that we care about, from electric vehicles to transit to you know to to, to solar panels. The new official plan is it. It, it is it is a, a fundamental foundational policy document that will guide the city's growth. So I encourage everyone really strongly to take a look at the city of Ottawa's website. They've got a survey there. Uh, the, the new official plan is not for the faint of heart. It's about 300 pages long. But what the city has done is they've, they've, they've created these one pagers where you can find an issue area that you're particularly passionate about. And it's been it's been summarized in a one pager and then you can answer a survey. And of course, for those of us who are interested, you can read the entire document or sections thereof and write the city with your comments, concerns, suggestions. Uh, and this will go to council in June. So there's still about a six month window to influence the process. Um, as part of this effort, uh, Ecology Ottawa and a number of other organizations across the city have created something called the People's Official Plan Group. We're trying to feed into the official plan process uh, and stay tuned for that. There will be uh, meetings. We're going to be talking about transportation when the new transportation master plan comes out. Uh, we're going to be submitting feedback into this this uh, you know this official plan window of, of opportunity by February. So stay tuned and feel free to reach out if you're interested in joining this. Where it's it's a group of groups, and so we're really trying to to be as broad as possible in terms of representing diverse needs of the community. Uh, we actually go beyond just environmental groups in this instance, and and there are some groups that focus, for example, on equity, on homelessness, on housing that are also involved with this uh, this coalition. The, again, uh, going back to the official plan, uh, there's a real opportunity to change our fabric of the city for the better. And uh, with that in mind, uh, we've launched something called an action plan for 15 minute neighborhoods. Uh, what are the policies that we need to really make Ottawa a much more vibrant, dynamic, and in the process, climate friendly, environmentally friendly space. We can reduce our emissions while enhancing you know, mixed use, uh, and, and, and dense development. So there's a real question of the how. Again, the official plan is the vehicle, but there are other engagement opportunities over the next year to watch for. Also, uh, there's a tree giveaway program. Uh, you know, feel free to participate. Uh, we're giving away about 15,000 trees uh, to folks all, all year long and encourage folks to get involved. Uh, and it doesn't have to be with the College Auto too. As I said, you can watch the city's tree files. Uh, you can get involved with uh, your community association. There are other ways you can kind of engage on the tree file. Um, and of course, the BioBlitz, this is an image from our 2020 BioBlitzes, but they'll be back in 2021, uh, encouraging, it's a citizen science initiative. You can do it from the comfort of your own home, uh, download the iNaturalist app, uh, go and take images of, of different um, uh, biodiversity in, in your local nature, basically, uh, nearby. And then we're also going to have a series of kind of webinars and, 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 and hikes, uh, kind of guided tours that you can uh, take part in, again, from the comfort of your own, own home. As the vaccine rollout continues, we hope that more in-person elements will be possible, you know, under public health guidance, but uh, we're still in a, in a bit of a wait and see uh, position right now. There will also be elections uh, for those of us who are annoyed, tired of elections. You know, I've got bad news. It looks like there could be a spring election in 2021 at the federal level. Uh, of course, that's always a maybe with the minority government. But if we're looking ahead in 2022, there will be both a provincial and a municipal election. Making climate change an election priority is something that we're really concerned about. And uh, we, we think you are too. And so encourage you to engage in a number of ways to make climate change an election priority. Ecology Ottawa will be creating opportunities to do that, to feed into the campaigns. I'm sure other groups across the city will also be focusing on these really important elections. Uh, and finally, Vision Zero, I mentioned this earlier, um, uh, this is a real opportunity to kind of uh, be more ambitious in terms of our approach so that we can uh, reduce and eventually eliminate severe injury and death on our streets, making it safer for all users. Um, and so this is also something that we're going to see, I think, action on, especially as the city rolls out consultations on its transportation master plan starting this spring. So. Get involved. As I said, uh, you know I'm here on behalf of College Ottawa, so I always encourage you to you know visit the site, uh, sign up to our mailing list, get involved, email me if you if you'd like to, and I can uh, you know forward it to the right organizer, or you know uh, you can get involved at the local level, your community association, amazing groups like SmartNet Alliance. Uh, there are so many uh, wonderful organizations 
working hard on different aspects of uh, the green economy and environmental progress. And so I think we're really blessed to live in a city like Ottawa with that many engaged groups. Uh, and I really hope that you get involved because as I said, the strength of the movement really depends on your level of engagement. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rob. That was a great presentation. Uh, lovely to hear about uh, all the important work that uh, you're doing uh, and the whole team at Ecology Ottawa. You know, hats off to you for, uh, you know, all the hard work and dedication. I know uh, when I wake up Saturday mornings, I usually have a great e-blast from you guys uh, coming at uh, 7 or 8 a.m. So someone's hard at work there uh, getting those e-blasts off. And, uh, you know, thanks for, for uh, you know, really fighting the good fight out there. So we do have a bit of time for questions. If anybody's got questions on this stage what you do is you throw them into chat and then i will uh, quarterback them off to our speaker so uh so we do have a couple questions here i've got one from uh from chris habits he's wondering um how does the gold belt avoid becoming green belt 2.0 uh i.e basically an empty space that people drive through to get to the city that's a really great question, and, and it's something that we're asking ourselves as a community. I think there are different reactions to the Gold Belt. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's nice to see the city talk about protecting, you know, uh, new land. But I'm concerned, uh, you know, from, from the pre preliminary comments I've heard from councillors, that this Gold Belt will not have, uh, uh, you know, teeth, policy teeth to really protect it. And so that, that's kind of one question, you know, how strong will that be? Uh, the second concern is, is it is it a belt or is it a loosely fitting sash? You know, uh, Daniel Buckles, a, a community advocate, was mentioning this at, at committee meeting, and, and I think it really kind of sticks. You know, if if you if you create this loosely fitting sash, does it just incentivize development within the areas first, and and essentially drive up land values, and and maybe uh, you know have the opposite of its intended effect? But I think that the the part that you were getting to, Chris, is the idea of you know, will people drive from further out? And that's always a challenge with with green belts, as 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 you know, uh, we've seen in, in examples around the world. And so I think the 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 answer comes from um, showing that there's uh, uh, real teeth and ambition in terms of other aspects of the city's policy arsenal. It's one thing to protect land. We're very much in favor of protecting land. We like the green belt. I think the gold belt could you know could be better. But what is the city doing to incentivize uh, dense mixed use development within the boundaries of the city of Ottawa? And I think that's a real question and something that, again, the, the official plan provides an opportunity to feed into so that there's no longer a need to sprawl as much as we've been doing uh, because there are new guidelines and new policies that, uh, that allow for smarter growth within the city. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, so Catherine Norman's wondering uh, about uh, road deaths. So she's wondering uh, how do road deaths compare in Ottawa uh, compared to other cities? So maybe just a, a, a quick blurb on that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question, Catherine. I mean, so in, in the, the Road Safety Action Plan document, they compared Ottawa to Sweden as a country. But then, of course, when you drill down and you find how we compare it to other cities, uh, it's sometimes uh, fairly shocking. You know, we're, we do slightly better than the whole country of Sweden on average, but we don't do better than cities like Stockholm. And I think largely speaking, and this is a generalization, but a lot of European cities are way ahead of us. A lot of American cities are, are behind us. So, so if you're looking at it from a global perspective, I don't know how we compare with, you know, Southeast Asian cities. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but from my knowledge of European and North American, uh, you know, road fatality statistics, we're probably somewhere in the middle, closer to the American side. Um, how do we compare with cities like Vancouver? Well, we're not as good as Vancouver. We're not as good as Montreal. I'm not sure how we compare with Toronto. Ottawa's kind of middle of the pack. And, and that's kind of a theme that comes out with a lot of these environmental issues. It's uh, we on the policy side, we sometimes have really, really interesting and sometimes innovative policy language. But because the follow through isn't always there, uh, we end up being somewhere in the middle of the pack or kind of, you know, average, I would say, um, uh, which is, again, I think there's a lot of room uh, for improvement, especially given the shape of the city. Uh, and, and, and there have been some interesting policies that have come in, for example, the complete streets policy uh, in 2013. 
uh, really means that all future road constructions have to be designed to accommodate all ages, users, and abilities. So there's there's something to work with there. It's really about the spending in terms of those, those extra road safety measures and really about consistency in applying the policy. Um, and so uh, as, as the, the stats indicate, we still have a ways to go to get up to the level of, you know, the Copenhagen's, the, the Amsterdam's and the Stockholm's of the world. Absolutely. Still still a bit of ways to go. So uh, Alex Watson's wondering, uh, your people's plan picture refers to home retrofits at the neighborhood level. So uh, he's wondering, what is currently being done in this area for uh, for home retrofits? I know uh, people are working on it, but he's wondering, you know, is there some bulk buying? Uh, anything you can speak to on, on regarding that? Great question. And actually, I'm really happy to hear that you have Janice who's on, uh, you know, later in the day. And, you know, if there's a Q&A session, I'd ask her this because, you know, she's in the weeds on this. I mean, I would say that, you know, so far uh, we don't see a major policy plank as part of energy evolution, but there's talk about developing one. Um, there's some potential with uh, local improvement charges or property assessed uh, uh, clean energy uh, programs. And I know that the city is looking to create something like that, basically to create incentives so that people, you know, uh, are, you know, are incentivized to, to, to go forward with retrofits. At the city level, um, you know, and this might not be a surprise to those of us like Casey, you know, who, who work in this space, uh, federal and provincial leadership here really matters. And to a certain extent, we're waiting on other levels of government to really lead the way. The feds came out with a small incentive program. Uh, but as far as my, you know, to, to the best of my knowledge, we're not close to getting back to a place where we were, where we once upon a time had the eco action program at the federal level or the green on program at the provincial level. The, the current provincial government uh, cut that program and with it uh, really did damage uh, to the green economy here in Ottawa and across the province. Uh, so we're really hopeful to see something like that come back uh, because incentives really, really help. And, and even as the city, you know, works hard to develop its own programs, having leadership from other levels of government in this area uh, could go a long way. Great. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, there's a couple more questions. Uh, Sun Chan, uh, she's saying, great presentation. Uh, can you speak to Ottawa's local foods, having many farms inside of cities' boundaries and um, and its connection to the Ottawa official plan? So so a little bit of a word about uh, food and, uh, you know, the farms that are, that are out there and, and local access to local foods. Yeah, great question. And uh, bumping up against the limits of, of my knowledge, you know, at, at College Ottawa doesn't have a food program Obviously, we think it's really important. Uh, the local food economy, the local food movement is just such a powerful movement. There are great groups around the city like Just Food that I recommend checking out, and they might have a much more sophisticated answer than this. What I can say is that there are elements in the new official plan that point towards increasing uh, local food production. Um, and, and part of what this People's Official Plan group is trying to do, and Just Food is a member of that, of that group, is trying to feed into the process to strengthen that. Um, I think, you know, Ottawa, sometimes if you look at it on a map, it's, it's got a tremendous amount of potential. If you think of the land mass, right? Uh, there's a lot of rural area there and a lot of farms uh, within the boundaries of the city of Ottawa. So uh, with the right uh, policy approach, we can strengthen that local food angle, I think substantially. We can get make it so that there are farmers markets in more corners of the city, for example. And I know that there's some work happening on those, uh, on those areas, uh, but I don't have enough of a sophisticated overview to tell you, you know, watch for, for policy X or Y coming up soon. Um, but that said, you know, I think I think voicing this concern, telling your counselor that it's important uh, is definitely a great start. Check out Just Food, too. I'm sure they'd have more information. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I've got one last question here. Uh, it comes from Kyla August. Uh, she's wondering, as the city moves towards a more sustainable lifestyle, uh, will there be more jobs opening up in all the aspects of transforming the city? So maybe a, a chat about uh, jobs and, and employment, because I know there's a, there's a ton of people on, uh, on the event here that uh, want to get involved and work in sustainability. Yeah, I think the answer is is absolutely, and 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 that was touched on in, in energy evolution, the city's climate plan, uh, comprehensive climate plan. They they talk about the economic potential. Um, 
So beyond the kind of the energy savings piece, like they're, they're, they talk about the transition to a green economy and what that can mean for the workforce. They don't go in a tremendous amount of detail. So I'm sure there are folks on the call uh, and some organizations out there like, uh, you know, that the focus on the green economy aspect that would have more detail here. Um, what I can say is that, you know, looking at where we're at now, especially on the energy side, we're we only uh, only five percent of the energy used within the boundaries of the city of Ottawa is locally uh, is 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 sourced locally. So ninety five percent of our energy is taken from somewhere else, uh, and and that really that really has huge implications. If you think about the renewable energy transition, uh, generating more and more of our energy locally. I mean, uh, it can only result in uh, better, better jobs and better local economy, right? Because we're we're stopping spending our money abroad and we're bringing it into the local economy. And so, the green energy transition certainly has that local aspect. On the retrofit side too, I know that there are great groups, uh, you know, and Casey's speaking later today from the Conscious Builder. Uh, that really kind of uh, that, that that are focused on that and that have that um, that appetite. Uh, government, as I was saying, at the provincial or federal level, could really do a lot by incentivizing that and spurring the green economy. But I think there's no doubt in the minds of uh, you know the staff at the city of Ottawa that there's a strong case uh, on 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 local jobs. I think it's a question of further articulating what exactly that case looks like and breaking it down uh, by area of work. Well, thanks so much, Rob. What a fabulous presentation! Great way to start our day. Uh, you know, congrats on all the uh, all the great things you guys are doing at Ecology Ottawa. It's certainly been fun to uh, work side by side here at SmartNet Alliance with you guys on on a few different things: energy evolution, Ottawa's collective impact, and uh, you know, really uh, hats off to, to everything you and your team are doing. Um, I don't see any other questions right now, so I think we're good to go. Uh, you know, want to thank you so much for for starting things off. Want to remind people that uh, our expert stage just opened. Uh, we've got uh, Glebe resident uh, William Nuttall talking about home energy innovation. So you can head over there. Uh, also want to remind people that the EV area is going now. They're chatting about e-buses. So there's uh, there's great, uh, great chat there. And the uh, EV guys will be back on this stage at 1230. Uh, to talk uh, about electric vehicles and everything you need to know. And, uh, and of course, our exhibitor hall is wide open, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Surf around, check out some of the exhibitors, go have a chat with them. Maybe you're thinking about putting up solar. Maybe you want to renovate your home. Maybe you want to get into battery storage. Uh, maybe you, you want to dip your toes into online learning. Um, there's so much out there. So, you know, go, go check out the businesses, watch their videos, uh, hop in and meet them live when they're available. And uh, once again, huge thanks to Rob Barnes, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for everything you do. And uh, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a break on the sustainable stage here, but we'll be back at uh, 12.30 with electric vehicles. And uh, go ahead and enjoy the rest of the showcase. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll see you shortly.